to hold it in the fire. Sacramento, California's state capital. Sedate, laid back, California style. But lurking beneath the surface is the unexpected. You never know when trauma may find you in the wrong place at the wrong time. When a tranquil surface breaks, putting back the pieces is up to the emergency care staff at the UC Davis Medical Center. 24 hours a day to be. UC Davis is California's only level one trauma center north of San Francisco. The staff gets word a stabbing somewhere in Sacramento is on its way. I'm Karen Fogelberg and I'm the chief resident of the trauma surgery service at UC Davis Medical Center. In her fifth and final year of surgery training, she's earned her slot as chief resident. If he had any signs of life before starting CPR, then we'll go for it and open the left chest. It's an all or nothing thing. To be up for 24 hours is not unusual. 36 happens fairly frequently. How far out are they? It can be pretty brutal out there and you just see it night after night. Are you, are you ready to go? A bloody scene in a Sacramento apartment. A jealous ex-lover jumped from the shadows, stabbing two young college kids over and over. The first to arrive is Bang Tron. He's bleeding to death from multiple stab wounds. Initially, he was uh, conscious alert at the scene, fighting. We found him intubated. CPR in progress with a second in ambulance. Does he have any access? Bang's heart stops. Fogelberg orders her team to crack open his chest to find out why. I feel no pulse, but open his chest. We opened his chest in the emergency room. That's a dire step that you take when you really have nothing else to lose. He was going to die if we didn't do something. She finds the worst of his bleeding around his right lung. Someone hold up the, 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 the script. When I was the intern on the service, I remember being just scared to death in the emergency room because the patient seemed so severely injured. I'm from Colorado. I've never seen anybody with a gunshot wound in their body or a stab wound. Ogilberg will try to stop his bleeding in the operating room. Can you get the elevator for us, please? Thanks. You need to believe, no matter how grim things look, that you are going to get them out of the emergency room and that you can save them. Here it comes, guys. Fogelberg starts to operate on back, but she's interrupted. Another victim has come in. Um, I'm not sure if they're related. It's probably so. With Bang in the hands of the surgery team, Fogelberg rushes to the ER. There's a second stabbing victim lying in a pool of blood. Fam Nguyen is the second victim of the surprise stabbing. She has three deep wounds. When we see patients in the emergency room, you really have to make critical life and death decisions very rapidly. And when you think about it later, you realize that you've made decisions um, that are of the magnitude that normally you'd want hours or days to consider. We're going to do a pericardial window. Dying. Fogelberg has to get her to the OR fast. Stick a finger in there. And just get a we have an X-ray sheet. Yeah. She needs to come up pretty soon. 
Well, when you see blood everywhere coming out of these stab wounds, it's coming from the inside. And what you're worried about is internal injuries. And there's nothing you can do in the emergency room to fix those. You need to get the patient to the operating room and get control of the bleeding. You don't want to waste any time. Okay, guys, let's get covered and get moving. It was Pham's ex-lover who jumped out in a jealous rage, stabbing Pham and her friend Bang. An attack that's left two young lives hanging in the balance. The emergency department is not all life and death trauma. For ER doctors like Nate Cooperman, there's also a constant flood of cuts and bruises, aches and pains. Nice to meet you. Is anything hurting you right now? Yeah, my leg is. Any history? Should, you know? I'm Dr. Nathan Cooperman. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine attending here at UC Davis Medical Center in Sacramento. Can you wiggle your toes for me? Can you do that? I like what I do a lot, although, as probably with any other job, there are good days and bad days. Okay. Your son's doing fine. Okay, okay so just There are days see. where I cannot consider doing anything else in the world. You know where we are right now, right? Yeah. And planet Earth, Pluto, or Mars. <laughs> and there are days that I just want to go farther away from here than, uh, than I can imagine. How much more can we torture you with that? Can we torture you a little bit more about the helmet? Yeah. I like some uh, gloves. I like Little Harley Jensen stuck her finger in the wrong place. A door hinge. Who's mom? I'm mom. Your mom, hi. Hi, Cuban, how are you doing? Today. Oh, Harley, how old are you? Get out of here. You're really four years old? Yeah? And let me ask you a question. How did that get on there? put her finger in the door. Oh, okay. You were there with her? She was doing in his class, his gymnastics class. And Harley was watching, and we just removed a swinging door from the entrance to the gym, and she stuck her finger in there. Yeah. That is attached to swinging. Yeah. She was attached to the wall at first. How long ago was that? It's been like two and a half hours now, three hours. Does your finger hurt you or no? No? Okay, good. Our trainer at the gym worked on her for an hour. Then yeah. we took her to the fire department, and they worked on her for an hour. This is not a super uncommon thing. Oh, I bet it's not. Yeah. I can't tell you how many children we've seen with funny things on their fingers, things up their nose, bugs in their ears, coins in their esophagus. We see all these things, although this Harley girl was, was pretty impressive. Who's this? This guy got a name? The fireman gave that to her. Got a name? Bambi. <laughs> Cooper McCall's orthopedics for some reinforcements. Despite all the surgery team's efforts, Bang has died. His knife wounds were too severe to fix. But in the operating room right next door, Karen Fogelberg now turns to Bang's friend, Fan, the young woman stabbed by her ex-lover. You get to the point where very little scares you, and you just feel that you could handle just about anything that can come in the door. So she has stab wounds to have since both um, here, Left midline. This one goes through the fascia. You do get used to dealing with a lot of social violence. It's very hard seeing a lot of young people lose their lives because of that. Holgerberg has hours of surgery ahead of her in hopes of saving Pham's life. So we see funny things here in the emergency department, and, and this Harley girl is an example of it. She comes in with this huge door hinge on her finger. You look at that and you think, oh my God, how are we going to get this thing off? Oh, here comes the guys that are working. Yeah. We had to get the big boots, the guys with the big clippers from the operating room, the bone cutters, to come in uh, and clip that thing off. Right there, right there. Do we have one of those, Harley? Daddy has one of those. Remember? Just tell us. Okay. Does it hurt? Does it hurt, babe? Is it fresh or pressure? Are you having a good time over there? Is that fun or what? Take one shield for her. We see a lot of children who are not acutely sick. It's part of our job. Yeah. 
Sometimes weeks, months can go by when you think, geez, uh, my training is not being well used. Right here, right. Right. Okay. Let's see, finger girl. Just hold up your hand. There you go. Let's see. Yeah. How's that feel? Is that exciting? Are you happy about that? Do not put your fingers in little holes because they will get stuck. <laughs> There are days that I'm very frustrated with my job. There's days that I'm bored with my job, but overall, I'm thrilled by my job. Bam has survived the surgery, but she's still in critical condition. It's hard not to think how trauma changes people's lives. I mean, the big hurdle, obviously, is doing the surgery, saving their lives, but then there's months of recovery, both physical and emotional. With a lot of injuries, particularly the assault, there are devastating emotional consequences. Fogelberg takes advantage of a break in the action to catch up. If things are quiet, I'll probably get a nap about an hour from now, maybe three o'clock in the morning. I usually don't get four hours sleep in a row. That's pretty unheard of. So I might get an hour sleep tonight. It depends what's, go what's going on in the emergency room and if anything else comes in. He was riding his bike on a popular trail. Instead, he was shot. And now cops are afraid of sickos on the loose. Helicopters and every available canine unit were sent to the shooting sites today. The gunman described as a white man, 16 to 18 years old, with a goatee and a hooded sweatshirt. Suspect has no apparent reason, no conversation. Go, oh, hi, how you doing? Just pull out a gun and shot him. Somewhere in a crowded Sacramento park, a sniper is on the loose. His latest random victim is incoming, just four minutes out from UC Davis Medical Center. Dr. Alan McNabb, I'm a fourth year general surgery resident, rotating here on the trauma service. I'm actually a major in the U.S. Air Force, stationed at an Air Force base just south of here. A couple of bumps coming out, that's just the wheels coming down on the gurney. A lot of places in the military, they need to send their surgeons, you know, kind of downtown to get the experience they're going to need in a wartime environment, ironic as it might seem. Carl Benson was shot out of the blue, just riding his bike in the park. All right, what's next? Biking along the bike trail. Went past this gentleman, kind of gave him a weird look, and then he heard a pop. What's your name? Thanks, Carl. What, what bothers you, Carl? The fact that somebody shot me for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> that'll that'll yeah. do it. The bullet tore through Carl's side. Let's get him roll to his. Uh, to this side. Okay, to his right. McNabb has two months to learn all he can from traumas like this. Because of the location of the wound, it's an area where it could involve his chest or his abdomen. It's very difficult in this setting to try and decide whether it actually violated either one of those cavities. So what we'll plan on doing is making sure he's stable down here, taking him to the operating room and looking with what we call diagnostic laparoscope. If you agree, you just go ahead and sign right there because we've sort of explained this to you. It says part of the reason I moved out of Sacramento. It's a big thing. A lot of people. I mean, you know, most of the psychologists would tell you, you stick too many people in one spot together, there's going to be problems. So. Human beings have this need to be in control of their life. When it comes to trauma, you try and rationalize what happened to people, but really when it comes down to it, it's really just a matter of nice people being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I heard the pop and I felt this thing. The first thing I think of was that my bike tire popped and it came up and hit me. And then I thought, oh no, my tires aren't popped. And I turned around and saw the guy. And uh, then I looked down at my side and there was blood coming out. I thought, hmm, this is not good. A 
another playground casualty need Cooperman's help. Hi, are you mom? Hi, I'm Dr. Cooperman. How are you? Little Lafayette got caught in the path of a flying brick. Oh, one, two, three, four, maybe four stitches, something like that. No worries, don't be scared. If it hurts a little bit, you tell me and I'll stop and I'll give you more medicine so you don't feel it. Children come in with a lot of anxiety. They come into this setting and they have no idea what's going on. It's just very novel and very stressful. I'm going to wait and see if you feel this needle and if you uh, feel the stitch. Uh, no needle. I'll tell you before. I'm sorry. It's just soap. Okay, this is a towel I just put over your cut. Okay? Hey, Mom, why don't you come on over and uh, you can. Uh, Hold Lafayette's hand and you can tell him that you're there. Okay, Lafayette, just relax. Hey, Lafayette, let me ask you something. Do you like songs? Yeah. You ever heard a song called She'll Be Coming Around the Mountain? No. You haven't? Uh-uh. Okay, all right. Jamie, you're going to help me out with this? Yeah. Ready? Here we go. She'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. You have to fill in in between. She'll be coming when she comes. When she comes. She'll be coming around the mountain. She'll on that one, obviously. All right. Tell you what. I'm going to give you a little bit more medicine in there. Oh, real still. You're doing great. You know that? That's it. Now I'm just going to tie the knot. In the emergency department, I'm never calm. I feel like if, whenever I let my edge down, that's when I'm going to get burned. That something is going to slip by me that I don't want to. How you doing, Lafayette? Fine, I'm just going to put a little band-aid on there and you're all done. Okay. Fortunate. Hey, Jamie, thanks for the hand. I appreciate it. Here we think. Do I have a career in singing or not really? That's kind of scary. That's scary. In the OR, Fogelberg and McNabb team up to operate on Carl Benson, the bike rider shot by a sniper. Sparing him long incisions, they'll insert a tiny video camera to look for damage. It's amazing to me the kind of work that I do. It's a very special kind of work that surgeons get to do and that trauma surgeons in particular have the opportunity to do. When you tap on it, it sounds like it's wrong if you've got air in the right place. So that's what we're choosing. And so what we'll do is we'll go in with this, this sleeve. It's got a sharp point on it and a guard device. And we'll insert that into the abdominal cavity and that'll give us access with this camera. Or lights down. Now Dr. Fogelberg will be able to look around in there. We'll get on our video monitor in a second. Seeing the kind of anatomy that you see um, as a surgeon and getting to actually cure people by what you do, that's pretty exciting. Carl's been lucky. It's just a flesh wound. Can you open your eyes? Very good. As the chief of the service, I have a lot of residents who are working with me. Okay, so he has um, a subdural hematoma, neurosurge is draining that, and you guys are going to do a deep deal. When it really works and when the team's working well together, it's really exciting, and um, that's a fun part of surgical training. Oh, I'm going to uh, go have a nap before things start getting crazy down here. Working three-day shifts, Karen sleeps when she can. Chantel, sweetie, does anything hurt you right now? Nate Cooperman checks in on a girl who hit her head yes, and was sir. briefly unconscious. Can you lift your head up by yourself? How does that feel? Does that feel okay? The head CAT scans are clear. All right, but good. to be safe, Beautiful. he How wants her doing? to stay overnight. You doing okay? There are some children who look okay to me, but I know that some of these kids will go down very quickly. So um, you always have to maintain a high level of vigilance because of that. What I'd say to you, if she was my daughter, I'd keep her in the hospital and watch her overnight because 10 minutes of unconsciousness is a long time. That's, you know. The other doctor said, well, if it was my child, I'd probably want to take her home and watch her too myself. What I would want to do with my child, of course, she, I just want to snuggle my child and hold her tight to me all night long. But what the right thing for is different. But again, it's ultimately it's your call. She's your daughter, and I'm not going to get in the way of that decision. But I need to give you my, my advice. Okay. Okay? So, tell you what, uh, let's get the collar off. Let you guys sit and talk about it and, yeah. and tell me your decision. In the setting in which we practice, you have 
you have to be a warrior. In fact, I will quote a good friend of mine, and what he was taught in his residency was, be scared, be very scared. Do you feel dizzy or anything? Despite Cooperman's advice, Chantel's parents decide to take her home. How do you feel? The next day, Chantel was fine, with no side effects from the fall. <laughs> See, everybody kind of rushed off. We just left a funeral. Yeah, we just left a funeral. I know, I know. I know and that happened at the funeral. Another shooting in broad daylight at a funeral. Someone pulls a gun, bullets fly, and four people are caught in the crossfire. I need you to give me the information. I need you to talk to me. Right? Upset family and friends gather outside. Are you allergic to any medicine? How old are you, Ronald? How many guns out there? There's another one out there. Whenever they're shooting victims, their emotions run real high. People do kind of crazy things. Well, someone just walked outside, somebody just having a cigarette, and they were uh, just dropped off. They put all of them in the car and they dropped them off at the nearest hospital. It seems to be gang related. Four people shot at a funeral are dumped at UC Davis's door. Okay, well, why are you bullshitting me? What's this Karen Fogelberg has her hands full. I have one more outside. Three of the victims only have leg wounds. What's the story on this man? But Ronald Fields caught a bullet in his side. A right chest tube, got a chest x-ray, then he's going to go to the OR. Okay. Oh, it's through and through. The bullet ripped a path through his vital organs. Do we have a blood pressure on him, and does he have a palpable femoral pulse? Three gunshot wounds down here, so can you write some orders on One of my jobs as the chief resident is to try and keep the big picture in the emergency room because the other residents are involved with tasks and lose track of time. So someone has to be down there really deciding what gets done. She's got a single gunshot. Another victim, a bullet in the leg, also needs care. You need to make sure it's not in her belly, Ron. Karen passes off the leg wound to a resident and turns her attention to the most seriously injured fields. In the emergency room, you need to be able to project the idea that things are calm. Sometimes your mind is racing. They put a chest tube into his side. It's painful, but necessary to save his life. Gunshot wound um, through and through, it looks like, to the abdomen. His belly's tender, his blood pressure's good. We just put in a right chest tube, got a chest in KUB, and I've called the OR. Fogelberg reports to her senior, attending surgeon Dr. Holcroft. Previously for gunshot wound to the abdomen. Yeah. In trauma, every minute counts. The faster Fogelberg can get fields to the OR, the greater his chances of survival. You guys already have statements and stuff? No, though? we don't have any kind no, of statements. That's why we came in to help. Yeah. So Somebody can try her. Oh, oh, oh you doors of six. You want to pick her? Let's just get him upstairs. If Holcroft arrives, then I'll come down. Well, it's going to be another long night for Karen Fogelberg. How is pressure, please? Cooperman is called in to see a 15-year-old who fell off his bicycle, Israel Perez. Can I do that? Yeah. All right, good. He was riding his bike and was ejected. John, is that the story? Riding his bike and he fell. How fast were you going? Not yeah, fast at all. Not fast? We're going to roll you. You just let us do it. A very typical case. We see, I would say, 50 a month of children like this who take falls, they get knocked out, they wake up, they're okay, and they're either perfectly normal or maybe a little bit dazed and confused. Mm -hmm. You're doing okay. You're doing all right? You guys know the folks coming? Yeah, mom's sitting in right now. Mom, okay,
it is a little bit of a misconception out there. It's not like every moment we're putting a tube into one thing. The vast majority of the time, we're thinking. We examine the patient and we're thinking, what do we need to do here? What's going on here? What tests should we do? Hi, Mom. I didn't uh, out of here. I'm Dr. Schumann. How are you doing? I'm Yo, you doing okay? He is still acting kind of sleepy and stuff. We'll just watch him overnight in the hospital, all right? Israel, you're going to be fine. What we'll be doing is we'll be getting some uh, x-rays of your neck and we'll get a CAT scan of your head. So you're a little bit, little bit confused. Cooperman, ever cautious, sends Israel off for x-rays and a CAT scan. In surgery, Fogelberg sewed up the worst of the damage caused by the bullet that ripped through Ronald Fields. Well, that was a case. Um, hi, Damon. Uh, let me tell you about this guy. In the intensive care unit. Fogelberg fills in the resident in charge. The abdomen with plastic, so he's going to go back to the OR in 48 hours. Liver's packed. Okay. He's sick overall from really all these injuries that he has, and combined, um, he's going to be very sick for the next few days. He's critical right now, very critical. With the surgery done, Fogelberg turns her attention to the family. It's one of the hard parts of my job is having to talk to families. I think that you get very close to the point where you yourself are so exhausted and so tired and um, sad and you have to be able to still be strong enough to be supportive with the family and not be in tears yourself. We've been taking care of your boy since he got to the emergency mm -hmm. room. Um, do you know, you understand that he was shot um, the bullet went in one side of his abdomen and out oh. the other side. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, you do they have to do that after Okay. It's okay, Mom. Ma'am, listen to me. We take care of people with very, very bad injuries. And sometimes we say, you know, this is so bad we can't fix any of it. And we never thought that. We never thought that we couldn't fix them. Okay? So don't you give up hope because we haven't given up hope. I don't give up. Please, please. Just let me see my child. All right. Just just let okay. me look at him. Yeah, I, I'll go in there with you, okay? Okay. Okay, sweetie. Why don't you want to come in and hold his hand? Why don't you just take a big breath? You want to hold his hand? There's a hand. There you go. Yeah, got it. Up right there. Thanks. Unexpected news on the boy who fell off his bike. Uh, that kiddo, there's something on a CT scan. Looks like he uh, might have a bleed up there in his, uh, in his brain that we need to look at real quick. They have a picture up on the scanner. Yeah. It's very serious, especially given the fact that it's beginning to shift the brain over. Israel's that one out of hundreds whose CAT scan shows internal bleeding pressing on the brain. A child like this needs to go to the operating room immediately. I do not want his operation delayed. That's, you know, yeah. first things first. <laughs> Just hours after coming in with what seemed like a few cuts and bruises, Israel Perez needs emergency brain surgery. I was in the emergency room, and then I heard that there was a code in the ICU. I just ran upstairs. And I'll see you up there, yeah. Um, that is left Shepson's right. I need to get some gloves on. Ronald Fields is crashing. His heart stops beating. needs to be resuscitated. He needs to get uh, blood transfusions and he needs medications to keep his heart going. Give him another anthem, Effie, please. Yeah. Can we stop CPR, see what kind of rhythm he's got? Okay, Effie, you're going to have to go over there. Yeah, I'm Ronald is not responding. They try an electric shock directly to his heart. Yeah, back. Let's see what happens. 
It works. Hard as fall, he's got not very good cardiac activity. But just barely. is a lot worse right now. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to get him through this. With great effort, they pulled Fields back to life. But for how long? It's 1 a.m. on the roads outside of Sacramento. Two couples are out on the town. It's a perfect night. When the unexpected strikes. Their Volkswagen bug swerves out of control and tumbles into a ravine. UC Davis's life flight rescue team is dispatched to the scene of the motor vehicle accident. This is the first on-site run for flight nurse Jennifer Noble. I was sitting in the front of the helicopter helping them locate the landing zone, hoping that I'd be able to see the lights, and it was very easy to find. I, that was something I was concerned about. I don't know what we're going for. No, all we knew is it was an MBA. That's all we knew. So we didn't know what the patient would be like when we got there. I wonder what we're going to run into. I wonder what it's going to be like. I hope I can do my job. It's okay, Mom. It's okay. It's all right. The family of Israel Perez, the boy who fell off his bike, is waiting as neurosurgeons remove the blood pressing on his brain. Alan McNabb steps in to help. I'm from a background of mechanics, manual labor. Surgeons are all kind of glorified mechanics. We all like being able to fix something. I, I think that's why we have a hard time with the kids. You know, they're so innocent to begin with. Sometimes the adults, they're drunk, they're doing drugs or something like that, and you feel they know better. And it's, it's not an excuse, but it makes it easier to be hard about it. But in the kid, there's just no way to, to feel like that about them. They're so innocent. It sort of affects us all. We just sort of keep it inside. I need a small syringe, like about a 10 cc. The operation done. A neurosurgeon tells the Perez family the outcome. We, what we found when we got in there, as we had told you, was a fairly large blood clot, fresh clot. We irrigated, cleaned up, and uh, he looked, the brain came, brain came back up nicely, and uh, I think he'll be okay. All right? He'll be in uh, the operating room for about another half hour. After that, he'll go to the recovery room for roughly another hour, and then he's going to the pediatric ICU. When the child who is acutely ill comes in and as you've made an intervention that has resulted in the child surviving their illness or trauma, there's no other feeling like that. I'm so glad. A mangled car awaits life flight and Jennifer Noble. Going down in the dirt, sliding down the hill, running to the scene. We didn't know what we were going for. Four people were inside the car when it careened off the highway. A simple night out turned tragic in seconds. One passenger is dead, two others only slightly injured. The driver, Sherry Matthews, is badly hurt. vehicle accident, the car went through part of a cyclone fence and down an embankment. There were four passengers in the car, and one person was dead. Just a bank car, but there's no name on this one. Hey, no, 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 just go ahead, slide down underneath there. There you go. Feel like you're getting your breath now, sweetie? Okay. Nice, easy breath. Okay, Sherry. All right. I need you to help us out. She's a lot more comfortable now, I think. She needed help breathing. She definitely had chest pain. I don't know what all her injuries are going to end up being, but um, the nice thing was she could open her eyes and could communicate I'm going to keep us. trying to breathe with you. I know I'm not breathing with you all the time, but I'm trying real hard to make it easier. Okay. I hate to say it's exciting when somebody's hurting. 
someone else in the car is dead. That's very tragic. But for our part of the job and what we do, there's a little bit of ex excitement associated with that. Working under pressure, working quickly, working competently, working together. Life Flight will have Sherry back to UC Davis in minutes. It's two weeks since Pham was stabbed by her ex-lover. Her attacker is in prison, but her fears remain. I'm very scared. I get nightmares. I can't sleep. Although her wounds were healing and we knew from a medical standpoint, a surgical standpoint, she was going to do fine, she still had this issue to deal with psychologically. Hi, everybody. <laughs> you feel up to going home? Looks like you got a lot of wonderful family around you. Because we were just your temporary family. This is a prescription for some pain medicine, okay? You can fill that here or at any pharmacy, really. We'll see you back in the clinic late next week or the following week, okay? They'll make you an appointment to see how you're doing and look at your wounds and make sure they're all healing up okay, all right? I think all that will go well. If you have any problems, certainly we're here 24 hours a day if you need anything. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Can I go now? This young lady had good family support, which is probably the most important part of it, and that's a big advantage. Tell me when you want to play basketball. I'll go get the door. When Ronald Field came out of the operating room, we felt that he had a 50-50 chance of making it. He became much worse as the night went on. Right now, they've asked us to not go in. They're trying to, um, his, his uh, heart rate has dropped to 36, and they're working on him. So we can't, you know, we had to clear the hallway, so in case they got to rush him. I'm just praying. I'm just holding him. He's a fighter. He's, he's been in there fighting all day, all day. And I'm not letting go until it's time. There's nothing more the trauma team can do. Ronald Fields dies. With these patients that come in very critically injured, you just work as hard as you possibly can to save them. And um, a lot of times, the, you just work very hard, try and fix them, and then when you can't, you just have to cut your losses then and just um, move on and take care of the people that you really can do something good for. But it's hard when the, the patients die. Life flight touches down at UC Davis, only minutes after rescuing Sherry Matthews from the wreckage in the ravine. Do you take any medication? You know something else I always tell my patients? Sweetie, when we get to the ER, there's going to be a whole bunch of people there. They're going to be examining you very, very closely, okay? Try to cooperate, okay? I know it's real difficult, but everybody's going to be doing something that's very important. You're at the Sacramento Medical Center in Sacramento. You're still in Sacramento, okay? They've stabilized her breathing, but the worst damage is hidden inside. Another casualty is incoming for Karen Fogler. Yeah, two months of this is like a marathon. You really have to pace yourself. <laughs> Alan McNabb is also on the way. This is a 43-year-old woman who was unrestrained, who went off a freeway off-ramp. She was really grunting with shallow respirations when we got there. So. I think being in the trauma room with a severely injured patient is probably as close as you can get to a battlefield scenario. I guarantee you when a soldier gets injured, they're going to behave the same way a civilian does when they get injured. And that's a human being that is scared and terrified. Okay, let's get her toxin roll. I think being calm and staying focused is one of the things you learn here on the service. That's something you just learn from kind of being in the trenches, kind of like being a battle-hardened soldier. for it to be positive. The team checks to see if she is bleeding in her abdomen. She is. the catheter out, run the skin close to the nylon. We're going to put in a left chest tube. She's going to go up to the OR. We'll get her head CT after the OR. 
With yet another casualty in hand, Karen Fogelberg presses on towards morning. When trauma strikes, the victims take off on a strange and often wild ride. There's been a car accident on a country road. 16-year-old Aaron Ewells, with no seatbelt to hold him, has been unexpectedly thrown into the arms of the UC Davis rescue team. It's impressive to me what patients will allow us to do and the kind of trust that they place in us to do the right thing. What the patient goes through, you have to kind of step back and look at objectively. And he's in this car accident, and some guys show up in their funny suits. Well, the next thing you know, he's put on this board, taped down. This must be pretty cl as close as it comes to an alien abduction. When he's whisked around this hospital and wheeled into this room, these lights are shining on him. There's people all around him that are very concerned about what's going on with different instruments and things, looking at him, strapping things on his arm. Non-tender, no step-offs. Dr. McNabb tends to Aaron Ewells. His chin is badly cut. His jaw is broken. But his leg fracture is the more serious problem. But a lot of it they don't remember. Most people uh, are not in a state of mind. They remember anything. Aaron, try, try to relax your leg. Can we give him some more? We call this bayonet apposition. The bone has broken and then slid like that. And every time his muscles contract, it pulls the two fragments like that and gives him worse pain. So our orthopedic surgeons are going to uh, way down here on a part you can't see, drill a hole through another bone and put a metal rod through it. Then they can put um, traction um, pulling devices on the bone and pull it so we can straighten this out. And that's what they're doing now. His leg bone is back in place, held there by weights. His ER encounter has been successful. Hey, sir. Three year old male. Joe Barajas, walking a quiet street, was suddenly jumped by five kids, stabbed in the side. Now he's in the ER, wondering why. Who stabbed you, sir? I know some other people already asked you this question. Ma'am, I never, I never seen these young kids in my life. Okay. Well, they, uh, there was five of them. Where were you? Well, the 23rd Street Light Rail. Have you been drinking tonight, sir? This afternoon, I okay, have. Okay, that's all right. I was in Korean War. I went to 54 to 59 in the Marine Corps. And those pictures they took out of my shirt pocket, and show you what a Marine Corps when I was 18 years old in Korea. You better believe it. This is a middle-aged man with a stab wound to his abdomen. And it doesn't appear to be too deep, but we want to make sure. So what we're going to do is to explore the wound and get an idea of how deep it went. And I was in Korea. I can't believe what's happened to me, like coming out from the light rail, coming around the corner from the 23rd Street light rail. That's when those three kids jumped me. Oh. All right. Sorry, sir. I mean, I think it goes all the way through. So we'll just do a lap. It goes pretty deep, so it actually goes into your um, abdomen. What we're concerned about is that um, the knife, you're going to be okay. We're going to take good care of you. All these things are fixable. But to fix them, we need to do an operation. So we're going to take you upstairs to the operating room. We're going to put you to sleep, so you're going to have a general anesthetic. You're not going to feel any of this, okay? Be okay. Why does that mean? Yeah. Well, never bother, no matter how nobody does that. Yeah, I understand. It's not fair. But this is what we have to do now, okay? You need to take you up to the operating room and take care of things, okay? So let me write the consent out for you, and I'm going to have you sign. And you have to remember that for patients, this is possibly the one operation of their life, and it's obviously not routine for them. And it's scary. It's unknown. They just trust that you're going to do the right thing and fix them. Joe heads to the OR. As Fogelberg promised, his wound was fixed, and he was released three days later. Aaron Ewells, the teenager rescued from the car accident, is on the mend. You know, as we were heading home, I just 
seen this very big flash. I remember waking up in the emergency room. Like, there was a big light above me. I remember getting pushed through hallways and hearing people say things like, like, uh, wipe the blood off his face a little bit or something. And then, I guess I passed out. It was scary. Very scary. Do a rec for Tim. You lay real still. Let us do all the movement, okay? On my count. One, two, three. Now you tell us real. So you tell us if it hurts, okay? Does that hurt anywhere? Does that hurt? I want to go home, wash my hair, visit my friends, and sleep. <laughs> I eat good here. That's one thing. I did eat good while I was here. This is a good hospital. Aaron's short journey through trauma has ended well. He'll be home soon. Another summer weekend in Sacramento. The warm days mean more kids are outside. Keeping Nate Cooperman and the ER team busy inside. I don't care where you care where I want you to go. Where is the best point? What I feel is a heightened sense of awareness. Oh. Just getting ready, making sure all the uh, bases are covered and make sure we're not missing anything. There's an injured 16-year-old on the way. Okay, uh, tell us the story. He was riding a skateboard off of approximately a six foot high set of steps, landed apparently oh, on his back, striking his head. Hey, can you speak up? Say something? Okay. That's okay. Okay, let's make a quick scramble. We want to see you as soon as we can. Brandon's been skateboarding in all the wrong places. One too many times. I don't know exactly what happened, but he took a, some sort of fall. I'm not sure if he lost consciousness or not, but he's acting really pretty combative and disoriented, similar to the other child that was taking care of. Yeah, just like we were talking about that other kid, we're going to cut in his head because he's not acting appropriately. You have a videotape of what happened because his, he was skateboarding with his buddy, and his buddy had it on videotape and showed his dad. The dad got the videotape of this injury. Oh my gosh. He's still, good. I mean, he's got a pretty good... Oh, he's got a good concussion. He's a little confused and stuff. Yeah. So we'll be watching him overnight. Because okay. yeah. he isn't talking at no, all. No, he's not, he's not his normal self. I don't know oh, that. No. Yeah. Six days after her dramatic rescue from the ravine, Sherry Matthews is recovering. Well, I remember getting off the freeway and the throttle sticking on the car. And the next thing I knew, um, I woke up in the... I couldn't move. And then Larry said we'd been trapped there for hours because I guess he was the first one that was coherent or whatever. And I said, well, if we don't do something, we're all going to die. Next thing I was on the gurney, yes. I remember the sound, I remember the lights, and I remember the air. And um, it was going through my mind, it reminded me of one of the war shows, you know, like combat movie. CAT scan on the skateboarder shows no serious injuries. Brandon will be fine. Oh, okay. So this kid's um, friend, this kid's friend who was skateboarding with him, um, videotaped him while he fell, and we have a videotape of, of the injury. So Brandon's friend seems to have been in the right place at the right time. Your buddy's doing fine. What were you guys Good. doing anyway? Skateboarding. Do you guys wear helmets and stuff? No, no. Never ever had. So he went straight back. Oh, head, head, head back. Head. 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 He lands and the skateboard slips out from underneath him and he falls back on his head and his back. It's actually a good opportunity. I have never in my life seen like the actual event that leads to the child coming here. You know, you just have the you always rely on the parent's history or the, or the patient's history. But have some uh, photo documentation is a great thing. It's sort of corroborating information and evidence and stuff. So that's fun. The evidence and stuff. That's a wonderful thing about here. Every day there's like a first something. And that was the first time I've ever had sort of some video brought in the story of the injury. Okay guys, so let's get back to the board. Uh, so.
Alan McNabb's two months of training with Karen Fogelberg are coming to an end. Overlying it. Well, yeah, I think you're right. Get the second film. All right. Well, here I am back at David Grant Medical Center at Travis Air Force Base. A little different than UC Davis Medical Center. Guess my hair is a little bit shorter, a little cleaner shaven. I'm back in my blue uniform instead of the green uniform, but doing the same thing, taking care of patients. It's nice here where we don't have as much trauma that when some does come in, you sort of have the ace in the hole of saying, well, here's how they do things up at UC Davis, and you really get people's attention when you say that. Hopefully, I'll never have to use all the training I got at UC Davis in a wartime environment, but it's nice for me to know that if it does occur, God forbid, that we'd be ready for it. So here's my, my dirty laundry. Um, you want to walk out? After three non-stop days, Karen finally as a day off. You don't notice how tired you are until it's all over and you actually walk out of the building. Then you're pretty tired. Well, I actually have my kayak on the back of my um, Jeep outside, so when I leave today, I'm going to go kayaking. And uh, I just got to make sure I don't end up in the recess room myself.